A History of the Yoruba People S. Adabanji Akindi The Beginnings The Yoruba have some remarkable graphic myths of creation and of origins. The most widely known Yoruba myth has it that at the beginning of time, when the whole surface of the earth was one watery matter, Aladumir, also known as Alarun, king of heaven, sent down some heavenly beings to create solid land, as well as plant life and animal life, on the earth. Bringing with them some quantity of earth, one chicken and one palm nut, they came down by a chain and landed on the spot that is now known as Ife in the heart of Yoruba land. They poured the earth onto the water, and thus created a small piece of solid land. They then set the chicken on the land, and as the chicken scratched at it with its claws, the small piece of dry land spread and continued to spread until all the continents and islands of the world came into existence. The heavenly beings sowed the palm nut, and it sprouted and grew as the beginning of plant life in the world. The heavenly beings themselves became the progenitors of the human race. The place where all this began was named Ife that is, the source of the spreading. The Yoruba believe, then, that theirs is the first race of humans, and that all human life and civilization originated in their country. One version of this myth supplies names to the heavenly beings that came down to establish life at Ife. The leader appointed by Aladomir to head the expedition was, according to this version, Obatala. Along the way, however, Obatala got drunk and fell into a stupor, and Oduduwa took over and completed the mission, and thus became the father of the Yoruba people and of all the people of the world. This body of myths is very strongly held among the Yoruba people, and its influence pervades all areas of their culture. The historian who embarks on studying, or writing about, the very beginnings of the history of the Yoruba as a people must start with an examination of those myths. The first Europeans to enter Yoruba land in the 19th century encountered it everywhere. For instance, the first Christian missionary to visit Ife in the 1850s, David Hinderer, was told, after he had finished preaching the Christian gospel to a large crowd at the palace of Ife, that all religion originated from Ife, and that what he had preached was no more than one of the versions that had evolved later in a distant part of the world. David Hinderer wrote, Ife is famous as being the seat of idolatry, all the multiple idols of this part of the country are said to emanate from the town, from there the sun and moon rises, sick, where they are buried in the ground, and all people of this country and even white men spring from the town. In 1882, Rev. Samuel Johnson, an Anglican missionary and son of Yoruba freed slaves who had returned to Yoruba land from Sierra Leone, was told by the chiefs of the city of Ibadan that Ife was the place where all nations of the earth have sprung from. In 1886, British agents visiting the Yoruba interior were told by the Alafin of Oyo that the Ifes, were the fathers of all and all people came from Ife, by the chiefs of Ife, at Isoya where they and their people were camped, outside the ruins of their city, that the Ife people were the fathers of all tribes and that if they continued longer in a camp and unable to resettle their ancient city of Ila Ife, the whole world would spoil, as they were the priests of the deities who ruled the world, and by the Siriki of the Ijebu, chief Ogunzagun, that even the English king can be shown the spot at Ila Ife from where his ancestors went out. Henry Higgins, the leading British agent in this 1886 mission, summed up his information about Ife as follows. There are all manner of legends as to the wonders to be seen at Ila Ife. The Ifes call themselves the conservators of the world and the oldest of mankind and boast that all crowned personages in the world, including the white man's sovereign, went out originally from Ila Ife, and it was curious the deference with which other tribes treat them although they are at war with them. And as everyone was supposed to be a descendant of the Ifes, they looked upon all strangers who visited their town in the light of pilgrims who came, as they put it, to make their house good, that is to pay reverence to departed ancestors. To the historian. Discerning the meanings and implications of these myths is important. Of the implications, the most obvious would seem to be that the Yoruba people believe that they originated in their present homeland and have always lived there. Since, however, it is known from other evidence than myths that the earliest ancestors of all the peoples of West Africa came into that region from other parts of Africa, the Yoruba belief can only mean that the Yoruba have lived so long in their present homeland that they can no longer remember originally coming into it from elsewhere. Indeed, Available archaeological evidence strongly indicates that the Yoruba are one of the oldest peoples in the tropical forests of the West African region. As for the introduction of the names of Obatala and Oduduwa into these creation myths, there seems no doubt that what we have here is a conflation of very ancient myths with later known facts at some point in Yoruba history. As will be seen in subsequent chapters, Obatala and Oduduwa were not mythical, heavenly beings, they were humans humans who played very significant roles in a great era of Yoruba history. Without doubt, what happened was that the contemporaries or successors of Obatala and Oduduwa added these two names to myths that had existed probably very long before their time, 
in an attempt to accord Odudua in particular the very high position he deserved in the transformation of Yoruba civilization in the most significant era in early Yoruba history. Furthermore, the myths appear to represent a statement of a very important fact of Yoruba history namely, the extensive penetration, from quite early times, of Yoruba people and Yoruba culture into the lands of their non-Yoruba neighbors, and the considerable impact of Yoruba culture in much of the West African subregion. More will be said on this subject of interfertilization of Yoruba and neighboring cultures in subsequent chapters. Suffice it to say here that, as far as is known, Yoruba culture exerted so much influence on, and absorbed such inputs from, so many neighbors, the Edo and related peoples, the Asia, the Bariba, the Noob, etc., and drew so many so close to itself, in family structure, trade practices, language, religion, political system and traditions, that the Yoruba people apparently came to perceive their country as the source of civilization and ultimately of the human societies which created observable variations in civilization and evolved myths that gave meaning and support to that perception. It is significant that some of the neighbors of the Yoruba in fact subscribe to parts of the Yoruba myths. The above, then, is the little that a study of Yoruba history can, as at this point in the task, discern from the people's powerful and influential myths of creation and of origins. From these myths of gods and heavenly beings, the historian, for a reconstruction of the earliest beginnings of Yoruba history, must begin to look into the available evidence of the earliest activities of humans. Thankfully, there is a wealth of such historical data in the oral traditions, institutions, rituals, festivals and folklore of the Yoruba people. Traditional Yoruba family structures, and monarchical and chieftaincy systems, attached enormous importance from early times to the preservation of traditions from generation to generation, since title to political and other significant positions, as well as to land, was based, to an extraordinary degree, on ancestry and history as preserved in the traditions. Reenactment rituals accompany various phases and stages of the Yoruba political system, and old centers and practices of worship preserve treasures of group memory. Yoruba people's varied and vast culture of poetry, songs, chants and collection of folk wisdom, offer extensive insights into the group's past. All these have greatly helped and encouraged the study of Yoruba history in our times. Much help has also come from sciences in the course of the 20th century. One such science is archaeology the study of prehistoric cultures through the excavation and analysis of their material remains. Another is linguistics especially its application to the study of the prehistoric origins and development of the languages of peoples. Since historical information available through archaeology and linguistics goes much farther back in time than the information available through the traditions and other aspects of Yoruba culture, it makes sense to start with the archaeological and linguistic record. Archaeological excavations have been carried out in almost all regions of the Yoruba homeland at Ife, Ifetito and Asehire in central Yoruba land, at Iwo Aleru and Atagbolu, both near Akure, and Owo in the Yoruba eastern provinces, at Apanir Badagri on the southwest coast at Mejuru near the ruins of Oyoila in the far northwest, at Atakep in the Ife Jumu area in the extreme northeast. Excavations done in other parts of Nigeria, and indeed in other parts of Africa, also help to illuminate the early history of the Yoruba people. According to available archaeological evidence, the earliest humans lived in the broad country comprising eastern Africa in an era estimated to be between 1 and 3 million years ago. Archaeologists are mostly of the opinion that humans spread out from the area of the Rift Valley in eastern Africa, to northern Africa, and from northern Africa to western Africa, slowly over hundreds of thousands of years. Evidence of human existence in the area now known as Nigeria dates to about 40,000 years ago that is, about 38,000 BC. By about this date, Middle Stone Age groups of humans roamed parts of the Middle Niger Valley in what is now Nigeria. Using tools and other implements made of stone, and perhaps also wood, bones and shells, these early people made their living by gathering food in the forests, by hunting animals for meat, and by fishing. If food was plentiful in a forest area, a group might stay there for a while, and then move on again. Archaeologists believe that in those very early times when human groups came gradually into the West African region from the northern African subcontinent, the region now known as the Sahara Desert was not yet a desert but a country of various types of grassland where many rivers and streams flowed. The total number of humans coming into West Africa was small, and their stone tools were primitive and improved very slowly. By about 10,000 BC, humans in West Africa were making greatly improved stone tools and implements, in the era which archaeologists now call the Late Stone Age. While Early Stone Age and Middle Stone Age tools had consisted of crudely trimmed flakes and pebbles as well as bifacial coraxes and chisels, Late Stone Age tools consisted of microliths, that is, small, 
finely chipped and finely ground stone tools, and ground axes. Some of the microliths were very probably mounted on wooden or bone handles to produce spears, arrows and other types of tools all for hunting, cutting, digging and scraping. At some late period in the Late Stone Age, from about 5000 BC, people began to make pots from clay, for fetching and holding water, a very important technological advance. But the most important progress made during the Late Stone Age was the discovery, sometimes starting from roughly 4000 BC, of agriculture that is, the domestication of crops and animals. With this discovery, people slowly changed from being wanderers to settlers the first real, solid, steps in the creation of human culture and civilization. Among archaeologists, there is a debate over how people in West Africa came to the knowledge of agriculture. Did they make the discovery by themselves or was it brought entirely to them by groups of people migrating into West Africa from other parts of Africa where agriculture was already being practiced? Did West Africans domesticate any crops or animals, or were all their crops and animals domesticated in other regions of Africa and then brought to West Africa by generations of early immigrants? Some archaeologists believe that people in West Africa did not domesticate any crops or animals, but received all their crops, yams, grains, legumes, etc., and domestic animals, goats, sheep, cows, horses, etc., from outside sources. But other archaeologists now question that opinion and suggest that while they did receive some domesticated crops and animals from the outside, some crops were also locally domesticated in West Africa. Since none of the domestic animals, goats, sheep, cows, asses, horses, etc., were, in their wild state, native to West Africa, it seems certain that they were domesticated in other places and later introduced to West Africa. Similarly, many types of yams were domesticated in other places and then brought to West Africa. Certain types, however, appear to have been native to the area now known as southern Nigeria in West Africa. These include the yam types known as Dioscoria latfolia and Dioscoria cayenensis including the various types that the Yoruba people call Uura. These types of yam would seem to have been domesticated in southern Nigeria, including Yorubaland, and to have remained more or less restricted to the area. What this suggests is that there was a local yam culture in Yorubaland before, or side by side with, the coming of many other species of yams that were domesticated in other places some of them across the African continent even from as far as Asia. Also, the two Kalanut species Kolanatita, Goro, and Kola Akuminata, Abiobeta, were domesticated locally in the West African forests. Some grains, such as millets, would seem also to have been native to the West African grasslands and to have been domesticated there. Finally, there is general agreement that the expansion of the oil palm to virtually all parts of West Africa was the result of the growth of agriculture. The oil palm is native to West Africa, but according to available archaeological and other evidence, before the growth of agriculture in West Africa, it formed only a small part of the vegetation. By nature, the oil palm tends to spread quickly only in places where agricultural activity has made the forests less dense that is, it followed the expansion of farming. West African farmers, therefore, were responsible for creating the conditions that led to the spread of the oil palm until it became the most important tree crop in almost all parts of the West African forest and savanna lands. In time, yam tubers and the products of the palm tree became the most important food sources for humans in the tropical forest regions of West Africa, supplemented over time with some grains, beans, vegetables and, much later, plantains and cocoa yams. Oils and fats from the oil palm fruit were the most important food items from the palm tree. But it also became the source of many other valuables edible nuts, an alcoholic beverage now known as palm wine, emu, various types of domestic fuels, and even materials for building shelters. It is not surprising, therefore, that the palm tree and some of its products became very important in the religion, divination and rituals of many West African peoples, including the Yoruba, from early times. All over the world, whenever the agricultural revolution started in an area, its greatest effect was to transform people from wanderers to settlers. Instead of wandering to collect food from fruits of the wild vegetation and to hunt animals, they gradually settled down to take care of their crops and domestic animals. In that way, humans began to set up their first permanent abodes. In West Africa, the first such homes were no doubt established in no more than caves, rock and the man-made shelters. During the later stages of the Late Stone Age, as farming turned wandering folks into settlers, from about 4000 BC, the scattered spread of farming people living in the West African region slowly began to get differentiated into related clusters and groups speaking proto-languages consisting of dialects that were related to one another. 
Available linguistic evidence indicates that many such groups and clusters slowly formed on the banks of the Middle Niger, mostly in the area of the niger benue confluence and above it. This linguistic evidence suggests that the Yoruba, Igala, Edo, Idama, Ibera, Nup, Kakanda, Gabagi and Igbo belong to a cluster of languages, now called Kwa subgroup of languages by modern scholars, belonging to a larger family of languages now called the Niger-Congo, or Nigritic, family of languages. The small cluster was concentrated roughly around the niger benue confluence. Over thousands of years, the groups in this cluster slowly separated as they developed distinctive characteristics, probably the last language groups to separate being the Igala and Yoruba. One study suggests that the Proto-Yoruba and proto nup language subfamilies seem to have migrated from a little further up the Niger, slowly expanding towards the confluence, and that during that process each finally became differentiated from a mother language group. The clear implication of all this is that the origin of the Yoruba people as a linguistic and ethnic group belongs in the process of slow differentiation of proto-groups which occurred in the Middle Niger and around the niger benue confluence, beginning about 4000 BC and continuing for thousands of years. It is, therefore, in this area that we must find the first home of the Yoruba as one people the area close to the niger benue confluence and further up the Niger, where the southern Nup and the far northeastern Yoruba groups the Yagba, Jamu, Ikiri, Oworo, O, and Banu, now collectively called the Okan Yoruba by some scholars, and the northernmost Igbo Mena, live today. From that original center, the Yoruba group spread out, over many centuries, towards the south and the west. As they came into these forests, they found small groups of people who had been there for a very long time, first as wandering folks, and later as farming folks. Archaeological excavations at a rock shelter at Iwo Aleru near Akuri, and another site at Ifatito to the northwest of Iwo Aleru have yielded valuable information about these earlier inhabitants. The human bones found at Iwo Aleru, dated to about 7000 BC, are the oldest human remains found yet in the whole of West Africa. Altogether, the evidence found at Iwo Aleru and Ifatito indicates that the earliest of these people had arrived in this forest country as early as about 100 million 9000 BC. They were scattered farming folks by the time the Yoruba elements began to arrive, and they were ultimately absorbed into the spreading Yoruba culture group. As the Yoruba were spreading out, there came a time when some slightly faster rate of migration from the northern African region brought somewhat increased numbers of people from that region into West Africa. From about 5000 BC, the Sahara region of northern Africa had begun to dry up as a result of some climatic changes in that belt of the world. As the region very slowly turned to desert, the peoples living there migrated out, some eastwards to the area of the Nile Valley, others southwards into West Africa, forming a somewhat bigger flow of immigrants than before. From some time probably after 3000 BC, this bigger flow of immigration began to speed up the growth of human populations in West Africa in general. It seems probable that these fairly large migrations are responsible for the persistence of traditions of a northern origin among many peoples of West Africa. Those of these immigrants who came into what was then becoming Yoruba land were absorbed into the evolving Yoruba culture group. The Yoruba continued to spread southwards and westwards. Southwards they ultimately reached the Atlantic coast. According to archaeological evidence, human settlers who were probably part of the Yoruba had reached the area of modern Badagri by about 1000 BC. Westwards, they continued to expand until their westernmost elements occupied territories in the areas that are now the republics of Benin and Togo. The Yoruba had gradually evolved as a group of many small fragments, each of the fragments spoke some dialect of the evolving common Yoruba language. Thousands of years followed the initial emergence of the Yoruba as a group and their many mutually intelligible dialects remained more or less clearly distinct, and ultimately came to define the internal differentiations that constituted the Yoruba subgroups that we have today the Oyo, Ijebu, Ahidi, Ijesa, Ife, Ondo, Igba, Ibarapa, Igbato, Akoko, Owo, Ikale, Ilohe, Itsakuri, Awari, Ketu, Sabe, Ifanyan, Idasa, Popo, Ife, also known as the Anna, and found today in Togo Republic. Ihori, Itsha, Mahi, Igbamina, Ibolo, O, Ooro, Jamu, Banu, Yagba, Bid, I carry some large and some small. As pointed out earlier, some scholars of the Yoruba people have suggested the collective name Okan Yoruba for the small Yoruba subgroups living in the area of the far northeastern Yorubalan close to the Niger Benue confluence, namely, the O, Ooro, Jamu, Banu, Yagba, and Ikiri. The name was coined from the common occurrence of Okan in the mode of greetings by all these subgroups. In this book, that collective name is used whenever such a usage is deemed to serve the purpose of brevity. For clarity also, 
the Ife subgroup in today's Togo Republic will sometimes be identified as the Western Ife. As the Yoruba spread and settled into their country, each particular subgroup inhabited a particular region. In the extreme northeastern region, close to the Niger Benue confluence, lived about seven small subgroups the O, Ooro, Gbid, Jamu, Ikiri, Bunu, and Yagba. To the west of these, in the Yoruba northern belt south of the Middle Niger, lived the Igbamana subgroup, and west of the Igbamana, the Oyo subgroup one of the largest, occupying the wide expanse of Yoruba land from the border with the Igbamana in the east to the border with the Ketu in the west. A small subgroup the Ibola lived to the southwest of the Igbamana, sandwiched between the Igbamana and the Oyo. All the territory of these northern Yoruba subgroups was grassland. Immediately to the south of the territory of the Okan Yoruba lived two subgroups, the Akiti and the Akoko, both inhabiting the hilliest region of Yoruba land. Akiti was one of the largest of the subgroups. West of the Akiti were the Ijesa, another large subgroup, and west of them the Ife of central Yoruba land, one of the small subgroups. West of the Ife lived the Ou, another small subgroup, and west of them the Igba. North of the Igba lived the small subgroup named the Ibarapa. The middle belt of Yoruba land occupied by these subgroups was mostly tropical forest, with the grasslands intruding into the Akiti and Akoko territories. South of the Akiti and Akoko were the Owo, and west of them the country of the Ondo, and then the Ijebu, and the Awari. The Ijebu were among the largest of the subgroups. The homelands of these subgroups lay in the belt of the thickest forests in Yoruba land. The Ijebu and Awari extended further south to the coast and occupied a considerable stretch of coastal lagoon territory. South of this thick forest belt was the Atlantic coastland, a narrow stretch of mostly mangrove swamps broken up by innumerable creeks and lagoons. The easternmost Yoruba subgroup in this lagoon territory were the Itsukiri. The Yoruba subgroup next to them were the Ilahe. A thin territory of partly forests and partly swamps immediately to the north of Ilahe was occupied by the Ikale subgroup. West of the Ilahe and Ikale were the coastal Ijebu, and west of them the coastal Awari. These coastal subgroups Itsukiri, Ilahe, Ikale and Awari were all small. The coastal Ijebu were the southernmost tip of the large Ijebu subgroup. The farthest western region of Yoruba land lay west of the Oyo, Igba, Igbato and Awari territories, stretching from grasslands in the north and touching the coast in some places. In today's terms, this area covers the middle and much of the south of the Republic of Benin and penetrates into the western provinces of the Republic of Togo. In this area lived a number of small Yoruba subgroups the Ketu, Idisa, Sabe, Ihori, Mahi, Sha, Orcha, and Western Ife. These far western Yoruba subgroups lived interspersed here and there with a people called the Ajo or Asia, consisting of such subgroups as the Egun or Gun, Alida and Fawn. There was considerable closeness between the Yoruba and the Asia. Like the Yoruba language, Asia belonged to the Kwa subfamily within the larger Niger Congo family of languages. It seems obvious that when the Yoruba stream encountered the Asia people in this area, it continued and flowed past them westwards, so that over time Yoruba subgroups existed to the east, west, and north of the Asia. With the Asia thus almost enveloped by the Yoruba, profound cultural affinities further developed between the two, with the smaller, the Asia, greatly influenced by the larger, the Yoruba, in language, religion, and social and political institutions. Ultimately, the Yoruba and Asia became more or less one cultural area, and the Yoruba language became a sort of lingua franca for the two peoples, which means that while the Asia spoke their own language, which was strongly influenced by the Yoruba language, most of the Asia also spoke Yoruba. In this far western Yoruba country, the traditions also identify one more Yoruba subgroup named Popo, but this has created a problem, since no Popo subgroup is identifiable today. Most Yoruba traditions speak of an old, far western, subgroup of that name. At the same time some of the western Yoruba refer to the people of the much nearer area of Badagri and Ajis, who call themselves Gun or Agun, as Popo. The probability would seem to be that there existed an early Popo subgroup which settled in a thin line along the coast of what are now the Benin and Togo republics, among the Asia, with the U as their western neighbors. Being considerably isolated from other Yoruba subgroups, the Popo subgroup, and the kingdom which was founded among them at a later time, probably became absorbed over time into the cultures of non-Yoruba neighbors, and, therefore, the existence of the name Popo in places along the coast might be survivals from their name. Presumably from surviving traces of that name, the first European traders along the coast called the towns of Hula and Anaho, on today's western part of the Togo coast, Grand Popo and Little Popo respectively, but the people of the two towns did not, as far as is known, explicitly call themselves Popo and were not Yoruba-speaking, they were Gabe-speaking, 
by the time of the coming of the Europeans. The experiences of the subgroups in this far western region appear to have been somewhat similar to the experiences of the Akoko subgroup in their rugged eastern homeland. It is obvious that the Akoko, too, encountered some non yoruba group or groups in these hills. Here, however, the Akoko seem to have completely absorbed such non yoruba elements. It is no longer possible to identify the descendants of such non yoruba group or groups, but their language or languages are not totally extinct being more or less discernible in the dialects of the Akoko people, in fact, in some places still faintly discernible side by side with Akoko dialect. The complexity of dialects in Akoko was also increased, over time, by contacts with non-Yoruba groups to the east, the Akoko Edo, often Mai and Ishan, and to the north, the Kakanda, Ibira and Noop. In general, the subgroups differed from one another in dialect. But this must not be understood as meaning that each subgroup was completely homogeneous in dialect. There were shades of local differentiations within the dialect of every subgroup. The most profound of such local differentiation existed in the Akoko subgroup, among whom dialect varied from village to village. In the larger subgroups, the differentiation in dialect resulted in what some historians have called provinces of the subgroups, each province speaking a variant of the subgroup dialect. For instance, the Ijebu had four large provinces first, the province of Western Ijebu which is known as Remo, second, the Central Ijebu, around Ijebu Ode, third, the coastal Ijebu, and fourth, the northeastern Ijebu, around Ijebu Igbo. The Akiti, occupying the rugged hills, had sixteen hence the ancient Akiti tradition of sixteen heads of Akiti. The large Oyo subgroup, occupying mostly open country, were considerably homogeneous in dialect, and had roughly two provinces first, the large body of population inhabiting northern and central Oyo territory, and second, the Epo to the south, in and close to the Asin Valley. The Ondo had for the population around the Oro Sun Hill or Ida Rock of eastern Ondo territory, the population of the northeastern, around Dilayaluji, the population of the deep southern Ondo forests close to the Ikale and Ilahe, and then the populations of the rest of the Ondo forests, around Odondo. Finally, the Igba had three the largest known as the Gabagura, in northern Igba territory, the Igba Okona on the river Ona close to the Ramo province of Ijebu, and the Igba Agban. About the earliest settlements of Yoruba farming people in the forests, there are bodies of traditions in most parts of Yoruba land. Such traditions are found in nearly every town with a long history of existence in its present location. According to these traditions, some settlers inhabited, in great antiquity, the location where each of these towns now stands. The first researcher to write about these early settlements, using the oral traditions of Yoruba towns, was the anthropologist Uli Bayer. In an article entitled Before Oduduwa, Published in the 1950s, Bayer identified many of these early settlements and the towns into which they later became absorbed. Since then, interest in these early settlements of the Yoruba forests has grown, with the result that what we now know about the subject is quite considerable. The traditions concerning these early settlements are integral to the traditions of the founding of the Yoruba kingdoms. When, in a period from about the 10th or 11th century AD, the period usually regarded as the Oduduwa period of Yoruba history, various groups went out mostly from Ife, to establish kingdoms in the Yoruba forests, they came upon some pre-existing settlements everywhere, and it was among these settlers that they established kingdoms. The traditions are unambiguous that the early settlers and the groups that came among them to establish kingdoms belonged to the same ethnic stock, speaking dialects of the same language and sharing many other cultural attributes. In short, the early settlers were the scattered Yoruba settlers in the Yoruba forests while the ones who came among them to establish kingdoms were bearers of a somewhat higher level of political organization that had evolved in the central region of the Yoruba country. About the founding of the Yoruba kingdoms, much more will be said in subsequent chapters. The early settlers lived in small settlements, each settlement, by about the 10th century AD, was autonomous and had its own ruler and hierarchy of chiefs and its own shrines and rituals. Usually, however, these settlements lived in groups that is, a few settlements were located at some proximity to one another in an area, and that group was separated from similar groups by expanses of forests. There is some uncertainty about what name we should call these groups. Some scholars call them village groups, and others still other names. In most parts of ancient Yoruba land, especially in central and eastern Yoruba land, it would seem that each such group was known as an Alu, and therefore, for simplicity, the name Alu will be adopted in this book and each settlement in the Alu will be called simply a settlement or village. Each Alu evolved slowly over a very long time. First, one small settlement lived in an area, then, over a long time, 
Other small settlements came one by one to take locations in the same area. Each settlement had evolved, according to the traditions, in the nearby forests and, under pressure of some difficulties there, had moved and relocated to what it saw as a better place. In this way, the Alu came into being, surrounded by virtually unoccupied virgin forests on all sides. We owe the clarity of these traditions to the manner in which Yoruba towns and cities arose in a later period of history. In that later era, the centuries beginning roughly from the 10th century AD, the distinct settlements or villages in each Alu were amalgamated or compacted together to form a single new town or Alu, but each pre-existing settlement remained a recognizable quarter in the new town, and its former ruler became its quarter chief under the ruler or king of the new town. In that type of setting, each former settlement gave much attention to the preservation of its own remembered history and the study of early Yoruba history is the richer today from that circumstance. We must now attempt a synthesis of all the information available from probing these bodies of traditions. As the Yoruba group and its many subgroups expanded into the Yoruba forests, they settled in small villages choosing for their locations the banks of rivers, streams and lakes, obviously to ensure reliable water supply, or the shelter of hills and rocks, for protection. In most locations, these small, primitive settlements were confronted by grave dangers, depicted in the traditions and legends as vicious, unforgiving, enemies. Chief among these enemies were wild beasts, hostile humans from other settlements, hunger and disease. The villagers, in some cases, lived in almost endless fear, which sometimes became so intense that adults ran away and abandoned children. Production of food was primitive, food was scarce, and whole families often had no more than a small, shriveled, yam tuber to share. Mysterious sicknesses wiped out settlements or forced survivors to pack and flee in panic. These harrowing experiences were no doubt the results of the very primitive status of the technological, economic and social life of Yoruba people in those early days. Food production was primitive and food was scarce because these were the beginnings of the practice of agriculture. Farming tools, made of stone, were primitive, farmers cultivated only small patches of ground, and the types of cultivated crops were few. Wild beasts were hostile because the earliest settlements, intended to be permanent and supplied increasingly by agricultural production, were the first sustained intrusions of humans into the habitats of wild beasts. People feared strangers, and that bred sudden aggressions. The people of one settlement would surprise another settlement and abduct its people to increase their own settlement, because settlements feared remaining too small, smallness made them vulnerable to known and unknown human enemies. The mysterious sicknesses and deaths were probably the result, mostly, of the spread of malaria. When people cleared an opening in the forest and settled and made farms, they thereby created an area where the malaria mosquito could flourish. However, it would seem that the people of the time gave purely supernatural explanations to their troubles. Thus, to appease the wild beasts, people began to worship the spirits that were believed to materialize through some of them, especially such large carnivores as the hyena and the leopard, and large reptiles like the crocodile and the boa constrictor, and set up shrines and rituals for the purpose. The mysterious sicknesses and deaths were attributed to the anger and malevolence of the spirits inhabiting the land over which people had come to establish their dwellings. The worship of primordial spirits of the earth, called Or or Er or Erel, became the major cornerstone of their religious life. In time, each settlement that managed to survive discovered a protector spirit in a local physical entity like a body of water, a river, stream, lake or spring, a rock, a hill or a tree that was believed to have magical powers. In this way, according to traditions and myths preserved in rituals and festivals, arose the worship, for instance, of the Oloda Rock in Adu, Ahidi, Olasanda Hill in Ikir, Ahidi, the Orosan Hill in Idan Rock and Idanra, the spirits of virtually all the rivers and streams of Yoruba land by the settlements established along their banks, and the spirit of the sea by the settlements established along the sea coast. Settlements also tended to relocate, repeatedly in many cases, in order to flee their terrifying experiences. To this, the end result was that settlements tended to relocate close together in places which came to be regarded as suitable, having reliable water supply, good for the crops, etc., and, above all, safe. The process seems to be that when a settlement survived for long in a place and seemed to prosper there, other settler groups, seeking to share in the advantages of the place, would come and establish their own settlement nearby and a group of small settlements, or an ilu, would gradually emerge. Most of these Alu and the settlements or villages in them are still more or less easily identifiable in the traditions of most parts of the Yoruba land, but only a few will be mentioned here. In the fertile valleys and low hills of the area that later became Ou Town in the far southeastern forests, there grew Ifana, Ir, Igbe, Utelu, Upo, Okasi, Addison, and some others. 
Around the foot of the Ulota rock in the area that later became Adu, in Nekiti, there emerged Ilasun, Ijala, Idemo, Ilamo, Irimo, Isolo, Inisa, and Ilaru. In the hill slopes and valleys which later became Ogotun, in Nekiti, there developed side by side more than eight settlements, of which Igben, Isaju and Arun are the best remembered. In the thickly forested plains that later became Akuri, many small settlements clustered together. Only a few of these are clearly remembered today, and they include Ipagun, Ikota, Ijomu, Okaro, Obanla, Idapechu, Ilmo. Similarly in Ondo in the deep southern forests, only a few of the many early settlements are remembered among them Oka, I4, Idoko, Akasha. In Ijebuode, west of Ondo in the same deep forest zone, many settlements were founded, but only Idoko and Igbo now stand out clearly in the oral traditions. In the area now known as Ife, Alukotun, in Yagba in the far northeastern region of Yoruba land, there emerged at least 20 small settlements. At Ife, Jamu, in the same region, there existed about 13. In a 1969 report of a preliminary archaeological survey of Ife in central Yoruba land, Paul Ozan pointed out that the Ife area features certain geographical advantages which must have been very suitable for early settlements. The whole area lies in a high bowl surrounded by hills which form a watershed for many streams flowing out through gaps between the hills. Well protected from erosion, it also benefits from fog and clouds which, in the rainy season, form over the hills while the rain drains into the bowl. Into this bowl, the earliest settlers came in some unknown antiquity. Over time, other settler groups found their way into the area. According to Paul Ozan, there were many settlements established there by the 4th century BC. By about the 10th century AD when great changes began to transform this area, there were, according to Omatoso Aluyumi, 13 settlements, namely Amalogan, Parakan, Owenrin, Okawo, Ichugb, Ire, Imojubi, Okoha, Ilurin, Odin, Idita, Ilaromu, and Ito. In many communities in Yoruba land, it is still quite easy to identify the descendants of the earliest settlement in a place, because the rulers of earliest settlements usually held, and their descendants still hold, the priesthood of the local protector god or spirit. For instance, in the Adu kingdom in Ekiti, the Elasun, ruler of Elasun, the oldest settlement in the place, is still much revered, even though the last holder of that title was defeated in battle and executed as far back as about the 14th century AD by the immigrant founders of the Adu kingdom. The influence of the Elasun sprang from the fact that he was the high priest of the spirit of the Oloda rock, in addition to being ruler of Elasun. The other settlements that came later to the area feared the Elasun, who, according to some traditions, had a shrine in a cave or rock shelter in the Oloda rock and kept leopards as pets there, under the care of a senior priest who bore the title of Bloda. Adu traditions claim that the people of the Elasun settlement never came from anywhere but originated at the foot of the Oloda rock and that the other settlements that came there in later times originated in the neighboring forests and later moved closer to Ilasan, especially in order to share in the protection given by the spirit of the Oloda rock. In the Owo kingdom in the southeastern forests, the Alale, ruler of Idison, the earliest settlement in the area, was high priest of the Ogo spirit, the protector spirit of the area. He exercised considerable influence over the rulers of the other independent settlements that later relocated to the area. The traditions have it that Idison existed in Owo since the beginning of time. Of the other settlements in the place, some claim that their earliest ancestors came from a nearby forest known as Igboir, a forest early known as the Grove of Primordial Earth Spirits. Early settlements in the forest area that later became the Akure Kingdom recognized the Oba settlement, ruled by the Alamba, as the oldest settlement not only in the area but in the world. This settlement housed the shrine of the most feared of the ancient spirits inhabiting the depths of the earth and was revered and feared on that account by the other settlements. In the deep southwestern forests where the Ijebuod kingdom was later founded, one earlier settlement named Idoko exercised powerful ritual influence over the other settlements. Such ritual influence seems to have later developed some political character. About what time, then, was the Yoruba country characterized by the existence of these settlement groups or Lu? For a significant time marker we have Paul Ozan's preliminary archaeological report, earlier referred to which indicates that there were some settlements in the Ife Bowl by about the 4th century BC. This would seem to indicate that by the 4th century BC, the Alu pattern of settlements had begun, or already existed, in the Yoruba forests. During the roughly 15 centuries that followed the 4th century BC, from what we know of Yoruba land in about 1000 AD, as will be seen in subsequent chapters, the Alu pattern of settlement became the widespread mode of settlement for almost all the inhabitants of the Yoruba forests. The date, 4th century BC, 
is very important because by about that date the knowledge of iron smelting and iron working was spreading in West Africa, inaugurating centuries of great economic and social transformations in parts of the West African forests. For about 15 centuries or more, then, most Yoruba people lived in Alu settings. The imprint of this is obvious in the culture of the Yoruba in the composition of their towns and cities, in the structure of their communities and chieftaincy institutions, in their religious, economic and social institutions. The development of the character of Yoruba society in those 15 centuries is the subject of the next chapter.